When we learn something, we build knowledge structures in our brain. But what kinds of knowledge structures are there and how do we build them? To answer that question, we are going to explore the islands on this map, starting right here with the fact. We probably all know what a fact is. A triangle has three sides. The capital of Mongolia is Ulaanbaatar. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Dogs have a very good sense of smell. These are all facts and they follow a similar format. They're all simple statements about something. They all have a one-to-one -one mapping quality about them. The kind of thing that you could put on a flashcard. And they aren't necessarily connected to anything else you know, but you do need at least some prior knowledge to understand them. For instance, to know this fact, you have to know what a capital is and that Mongolia is a country. But beyond that, you don't have to know anything about Mongolian history or culture or anything like that. But knowing a bunch of facts doesn't really make you good at anything, except for perhaps answering questions at trivia night. You might think of bare factual knowledge as a lookup table. So when someone asks you a question like, what is the capital of Mongolia? Your brain searches for an answer to that question. Now maybe it finds the right answer. In which case you think you know the right answer and you do. Now in some cases you can't find any answer whatsoever. In which case you know that you don't know the fact or the right answer. And then in some cases, you know the wrong answer, maybe because your brain confused two cities in its mind, or maybe you learned the wrong answer from somewhere. In that case, you think you know the right answer, but you're actually wrong. But the most important stuff that we learn is not like this. If you want to be good at problem solving and at decision making, facts like these just don't help that much. For that, we have to travel to a different island. Conceptual knowledge is one of the backbones of human learning. When I say the word triangle, I'm willing to bet that your brain did not come up with a list of triangle facts. What probably just happened is that your mind came up with the idea of a triangle. Now, maybe it was an image or maybe it wasn't. Either way, you are thinking about the concept of a triangle. The other thing that happens is that your brain is giving you preferential access to other ideas that are related to triangles. So you might be thinking of other similar shapes like squares and rectangles and circles. Maybe the Pythagorean theorem comes to mind if you spent many hours using that. There may be other more personal experiences in trigonometry classes or geometry classes. The point is that a well-rounded concept seems to be a different kind of mind object than a simple fact is. Now, one of the nice things about concepts is that a lot of facts can be derived from a concept. So if you think of a dog, for instance, well, dogs have four legs, they have fur, they bark and growl, but the feeling of thinking of a concept is different than the feeling of looking up a series of facts. There are sometimes when we build concepts out of maybe a series of connected facts, more often, we develop conceptual knowledge by looking at examples of things or non-examples of things or developing analogies for different ideas. Most children learn what a dog is through experience. Now, maybe they have some personal experiences with the dog. Maybe they see pictures of dogs. Maybe they see pictures of things that are not dogs but could be dogs if you don't know that much about animals. I know nothing about physics, but when I think of a concept like gravity, I tend to think of an analogy, like the analogy of the blanket and the giant bowling ball warping the blanket. For humans, at least, conceptual knowledge is a lot more useful than a fact lookup table. Concepts are multidimensional, so there's not just a one-to-one -one correspondence between labels. Concepts can also relate to other concepts in flexible complex ways. With conceptual knowledge, you can do a lot more than just answer trivia questions. You can start to answer questions like, what would a dog do if they were lost in the woods? Well, you know, maybe they would use their sense of smell to try to find food or maybe try to find a scent that was familiar to them and, and find a person that they knew. If you shaved off a dog's fur, 
how would they feel? They would probably feel cold, at least for one thing, because we know that fur helps keep dogs warm. In most areas, conceptual knowledge alone is not really enough to make us really good at something. Imagine a surgeon who has a wonderful knowledge of surgery, but has never actually practiced surgery. Or maybe a cook who has never cooked food, but just knows a lot about cooking. We also need procedural knowledge and procedural skill. So what's the difference? Procedural knowledge would be knowing that we have to isolate the unknown variable in order to solve this problem. Procedural skill would be having the actual ability to isolate the unknown variable. Now, these two are not necessarily connected. You can have the skill without the knowledge and you can have the knowledge without the skill. What's the difference between conceptual knowledge and procedural knowledge? Well, conceptual knowledge is knowledge about objects, knowledge about things. Procedural knowledge is knowledge about the steps that you take to get a certain result. As you learn something new, it's going to have a balance of conceptual and procedural learning with procedural skill building, also known as practice. Research suggests that conceptual and procedural aspects to learning support each other. So understanding physics principles more deeply can help you solve physics problems more effectively. Maybe that one's obvious, but also solving more physics problems helps you to understand physics principles more deeply. One of the problems that comes up is someone can have a lot of conceptual knowledge without any real practical skill or they can also have a lot of practical skill without that much conceptual knowledge. Now we saw examples of the first problem before with the surgeons who have never done surgery and the cooks who have never cooked anything, but there's plenty of examples of the second problem. For instance, students preparing for a science or math exam, they tend to get better at procedural skills at solving the actual problems, but oftentimes they might not have equivalent gains or any gains at all in terms of conceptual knowledge. Moving back and forth between the two seems to be a pretty effective way of learning most topics. But in a lot of scenarios, we don't do that. In medical schools and law schools, students get a huge amount of conceptual knowledge kind of dumped on them for years without really any practical experience. So that's a whole nother conversation though. So we talked about knowledge that is deeper than fact knowledge, but I also wanted to talk about knowledge that is shallower than fact knowledge. When we talk about knowing a fact, my assumption was earlier that we had some prior knowledge that lets us understand the meaning of that fact. But we can answer a question like, what is the capital of Mongolia without knowing anything about the question or without even understanding? The question. All we have to do is to associate that sequence of sounds. What is the capital of Mongolia? With the sequence of sounds for the correct answer. Ulaanbaatar. This happens a lot in schools where students pretend to know things when all they have done is really to associate answers with questions, but they don't really necessarily understand the meaning of what the question is asking. An even shallower kind of knowledge would be the ability to just merely recognize the right answer. In multiple choice questions, you can recognize the right answer in the same way that you might recognize where to turn on a street, even though you wouldn't have been able to say what the right thing to do was beforehand. If we want to become good at something, if we want to learn things deeply, we want to spend a lot of time bouncing between these two islands on the right side of the map here. As we do that, we are building another kind of knowledge that I haven't even talked about yet, which is tacit or implicit knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge that we either don't express or can't express. But I'm going to make another video about that and I'll link it here when it comes out. I do want to say this is not the only way of mapping out how knowledge looks like in the mind. There are other ways we can break knowledge out and other kind of complex relationships we could highlight if we wanted to. But the point was just to give an overview of how different kinds of knowledge leads to different kinds of outcomes. Before you go, there is one island that we haven't visited yet, which is the island of appreciation. Liking this video would be awesome and it would tell me that I should make more videos like this one. See you next time.